All right, it's 5.30, so we're going to get started. And if people come in late, they will miss my opening remarks, which is going to be OK. So uh, thank you for coming out in the rain. Uh, my name's Andy Nathan. I'm in the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. I'm a China specialist. And Alex Cooley from the Harriman Institute and I, are you the director now of Harriman? Yeah. He's a former director. I'm a former director. Our directors told Alex and me to organize this event. So here we are. This is the Borton Mosley Distinguished Lecture Series, or one of the lectures in that series, on Eurasia. It's a joint project of our two institutes. This lecture series was funded by an anonymous donor years ago in honor of two uh, professors who were the leaders of our two institutes back in the past. Uh, Borton was Hugh Borton, who uh, taught at Columbia from 1937 to 1958. He was a famous Japan specialist. He had a very long, distinguished, interesting, varied career, but the point of it that's relevant here is that he was the second director of what was then called the East Asian Institute, now the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, and he was a leader in the study of Japan, published a number of books on Japan. At one point, Borton served in the State Department planning for the end of the war, and one of his important contributions was to argue that the American occupation of Japan should not abolish the role of the emperor, um, which, as you know, was the, the occupation did, did in fact not abolish that post, and that has been controversial, but um, many people think that helped to maintain the stability of Japan in the post-war period. Philip Mosley taught at Columbia from 1940 to 1966, and he was the co-founding director of the Russia, what was then called the Russia Institute, now the Harriman Institute. And he also served uh, in other capacities. He was worked in the State Department, also planning for a post-war reconstruction of Europe. He was the director of studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He did a variety of things. But the reason for establishing this uh, Borton Mosley uh, lecture series uh, had to do with the roles of the two men in creating these two institutes. And the idea that the donor, I don't know who the donor was, as I say, it's an anonymous gift, uh, seemed to have in connecting the two institutes was this idea of Eurasia, which is in the title of this lecture series, lectures on Eurasia. Of course, you know, Eurasia is the largest continent in the world. It was held by the great British uh, geographer Sir Halford Mackinder to be the hinge of all history, to be the, the heartland, the strategic heartland of the world. And today we have two great experts on this strategic heartland looking at the complex interactions that are going on within that strategic heartland. Um, I want to introduce, first of all, Yun Sun, who is, whom I have been on online with many times, but never met her in person until today. But I, every time that I'm online with her in some event, I'm really swept away by her depth of knowledge and her, her insightfulness and, and wisdom in analyzing things having to do with China's relations with the whole rest of the world. She's an expert in China, Middle East, China, Africa, China, Southeast Asia, China, US, and everything about China. She's a senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia program and director of the China program at the Stimson Center. And previously, she's been associated with the Brookings Institution and the International Crisis Group. Sergei Radchenko is our second expert, who's a tremendous expert on uh, on, on Russia and, and, and Russia's uh, Cold War history, Russia's uh, relationship with China. Um, uh, and he is uh, associated with the School of Advanced International Studies. But I just learned now that he doesn't teach at the Washington campus, but at the Bologna campus. So I'm very jealous. And uh, it's not fair. 
what some of the stuff that goes on. Uh, uh, right now, those of us in the China field are suffering from the, um, the shriveling up of, of scholarly uh, communication with China, with exchanges. And part of it is imposed by the Chinese government, but part of it is imposed by the US government which is making it hard for Chinese students and scholars to get visas or to be cleared for visiting scholar positions in American universities or to sometimes they get pulled aside at customs at immigration and interrogated. And I just want to point out that uh, Yun Sun came from China. She got her BA and her MA at the Chinese uh, Foreign Affairs College and Sergei Radchenko came from from Russia. He's born in Russia, uh, though he got his PhD at LSE. I don't know that you did any undergrad in Russia, did you? No. No, I didn't. No, but I mean, the point is, I think, here we're going to be informed by two scholars who came into this country from not only foreign countries, but countries that, um, you know, are strategic rivals or threats to the United States, but as scholars, their presence here is incredibly valuable to us. Um, our moderator is Alex Cooley, uh, who, uh, sitting right here, who is an uh, enormously accomplished colleague in the Columbia environment, even though he has to teach in New York and not in Italy. Um, he is the uh, Claire Toe, Professor of Political Science at Barnard College. He's a member and former director of the Harriman Institute. He's the vice provost at Barnard for research libraries and academic centers. He's the author of numerous very interesting books. He's a big expert on international money laundering and corruption, not an expert in practice, but in analysis. And his most recent book is Exit from Hegemony, The Unraveling of the American Global Order with Oxford University Press. And he's a graduate MA and PhD of Columbia. So we're very proud of that. The proceedings are that Alex will introduce uh, the subject of the panel. And then we'll ask each of our two speakers to speak uh, and to give their analyses of, of this issue. And then Alex and I may, Alex will make a couple comments or questions and I may do the same. And then we'll open it up to the you and the audience for your questions and comments. Alex. Andy, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for attending this in-person lecture and at home if you're watching this. Uh, at a later date on YouTube. Um, but we're delighted to be able to do this in person again, right? And this is an event that brings together these two great regional studies institutions, um, both of them um, uh, founded in a very different era, but for the purpose of fostering regional understanding and also questioning our own assumptions and frameworks about areas uh, and, 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 and bringing independent expertise to bear. Um, I'll just say a few things about this topic. It, you know, the Russia-China relationship is an object of much analysis, intrigue, speculation, sort of unfounded assertions. Um, I've uh, s dealt with it uh, quite a bit in my own work on Central Asia, right, where uh, scholars and policy analysts are trying to figure out, um, is this an actual strategic partnership, right? Do they really mean it? Um, or is this an asymmetrical relationship? Is Russia, to coin a phrase, China's junior partner um, in a region? Is Russia a taker of Chinese foreign policy preferences? Or uh, do you see mutual accommodation of the two? Um, by way of introduction, I'll say before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, the previous uh, seismic geopolitical event um, was the US's sudden withdrawal from Afghanistan and thus ending its presence in Central Asia where it had been since really 2001. And what was intriguing for me as a Central Asian specialist was that this was now 
uh, the era of a post-American world in Central Asia, that uh, both Russia and China actually pressured, according to some news reports, the Central Asian countries not to allow the US to maintain some bases for surveillance flights um, to uh, facilitate that withdrawal. Very different than 2001, when both China and Russia supported uh, the US and the coalition presence in Central Asia. Um, so since then, we've seen regional architectures promoted by both China and Russia coexisting in the world, security organizations, economic organizations, um, and they've managed not only to overlap, they've managed to mutually accommodate each other, right? And so to me, Central Asia points to increasing cooperative ties um, between the two. So uh, next crisis now, and what we're looking at is the war in Ukraine. And I feel as if these questions have emerged once again about the nature of the partnership. Is it for real? Is it an alliance? What are the stakes? And I want to also under, underscore um, two particular issues here. All right? One is uh, not only how the regimes view one another, Right? And do they view that they have certain things in common with each other? And in terms of the, the, the implications of uh, uh, the outcome of this war, right? Um, so that part. But two, how have regional theaters that we consider to be either in East Asia um, or in um, Europe and Eurasia, how have they influenced each other's thinking? Right? Have there been any Chinese lessons about, say, European and US reactions um, that they saw, in, say, in terms of sanctions um, that might be applied or, or th thought about in the context of a place like Taiwan? Um, has uh, Russia itself rethought its own uh, 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 position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the global south um, and its own uh, kind of messaging as the war has gone on, sort of appealing less um, to sort of justifying what's going on in Ukraine uh, in terms of its own war of, of aggression and sort of denying Ukrainian identity and more in terms of saying, no, no, this conflict in Ukraine is about the world order, right? It's about something much bigger um, than uh, just us here. So we have two wonderful uh, distinguished experts uh, who are going to um, address these and other issues. And so we'll listen to them. I'll pose maybe one or two questions, and then we'd like to hear from you. So uh, during the Q&A, please notice there is a microphone um, in the middle, and let us know who you are um, before you uh, uh, ask your questions. So uh, without further ado, Yun, please, the floor is yours. What is Beijing's view of how the Ukraine war has impacted their own relationship with Russia? I was too excited, forgot about my mic. Well, thank you, Professor Nason and Professor Cooley. Um, I cannot tell you how much honored, how honored I am to be here today, because you may not know this. You, thank you, uh, Andy, for, for telling people that about my history being a Chinese student, foreign affairs college, seven years, came here as a student. But I did not tell you, when I was an undergraduate student at Foreign Affairs College, which is affiliated with Chinese Foreign Ministry, I knew you, I knew your work. And it was discussed in classrooms back good. then. And no, 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 um, there are a lot of interesting deliberations as for what the American view of certain Chinese uh, culture and Chinese civilization looks like. And you definitely were a, a, a huge intellectual voice in that, um, in that debate. And Alex, of course, 12 years ago, again, I was in Beijing for International Crisis Group, and we had a long conversation about what Shanghai Cooperation Organization might actually mean. So I really want to thank you for your mentorship, even without you knowing it, and for your intellectual uh, guidance for uh, students as currently from China. I hope the academic space still exists for more Chinese students of uh, political science to come here, at least not from the STEM discipline. <laughs> Um, I was asked to talk about how the war in Ukraine has uh, changed China's thinking about Russia, China, US relations. Um, so I'll cut to the chase. As the first hot war after the, well, some would say the first hot war among uh, great powers after the end of the Cold War, the Ukraine war has already had its profound impact over international relations, especially for major power or great power relations. 
So war in Ukraine has consolidated or have aggravated some of the trend of strategic competition among great powers that had already been existing in, in the international system. In the foreseeable future, I think from the Chinese perspective, the alignment between China and Russia within this, uh, well, if we still call it a strategic triangle among US, China, and Russia, this alignment between China and Russia will continue. And we most likely will see the partnerships between these two countries continue to deepen. But at the same time, we're also going to see many problems continue to exist and also faster between Beijing and Moscow. So that's a paradoxical relationship between China and Russia. But at the same time, the lack of trust, competition, or even confrontation, and sometimes even potential conflict between US and China will also exacerbate. So what we're looking at is a limited, some people would call it a limited alignment or limited alliance between China and Russia, but at the same time, Beijing and Moscow maintain their competitive trend or competitive policy against the United States. I always think that the most interesting aspect of this trilateral relationship is that it seems that the United States is the one party that's an outlier at being isolated in this, uh, in this strategic triangle, if there is one. Um, but at the same time, if the US chooses to improve or to change its policy towards either China or Russia, that is going to have a fundamental impact over the depth and the breadth and the nature of the alignment between China and Russia. From Beijing's perspective, Ukraine war is not a determining factor for US-China relations because the reality of great power competition between uh, US and China had already been consolidated during the Trump era. And this has not really changed or fundamentally changed under President Biden. Although both countries, US and China, have been trying to more effectively to manage their, uh, their competition to ensure their relationship is not going to be derailed. The Ukraine war has exacerbated some of the confrontational elements between US and China. So on the Chinese side, from the very beginning of the war, China saw that the expansion of NATO as the cause of Russia's uh, resorting to, to war. And therefore, China has adopted a tacit approval or at least an ambivalent, non-committed ambivalence towards Russia's violation of UN Charter, uh, Russia's violation of other countries, another sovereign nation, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Despite the fact that the expansion of NATO does not have a direct bearing over China's national security, but Russia's experience and the, the Russia's destiny or Russia's experience being cornered and being pushed by NATO, for China, inevitably, it resonates deeply with China and has solicited a lot of empathy as well as sympathy from the Chinese population. China has been concerned that US would replicate the NATO experience uh, in East Asia and to form a East Asia or Northeast Asia mini NATO among uh, US, Russia, uh, US, South Korea and Japan. So therefore, on the issue of the NATO expansion, it has been quite impossible for China to adopt a position that's in support of Ukraine's choice, which is why that since the beginning of the war, we have seen from the Chinese strategic community mostly criticism and condemnation of Ukraine rather than Russia. For the Chinese realists who believe in real, polit real politics, not respecting the security concerns of great powers and merely wanting to rely on alignment or dependence on external powers, external to the region, to introduce US or NATO security guarantee to maintain its own security. For the Chinese, this is a fundamental reason that Ukraine is invaded. When China looks at its own neighbors and realizes that countries including Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines are in fact using the same approach or the same policy to maintain its own national security, the Chinese embassy has always been with Russia. So therefore, the Ukraine war in the Chinese policy community analysis, it is a war that's promoted by the United States, led by the NATO, and in the end, a war that Russia had to respond to. This is also why China has maintained this pro-Russia neutrality in the war. Fundamentally speaking, China's attitude of Ukraine war is decided by geopolitics. And in China today, 
US-China competition is the biggest geopolitics. The, which means that when China assesses its own response or policy towards the war in Ukraine, right or wrong is not the most critical determinant. Instead, how the end of the war or how the consequences of the war will affect China, that is China's most determining factor in, uh, determining factor in China's policy. So for China, a Russia that is defeated is not only going to be a, uh, is not only not only won't be able to help China in China's competition with the United States, but on the other hand, will lead to further advancement of the United States as a West towards China. And so therefore, to prevent Russia from losing in this war is a first priority when China look at the war in Ukraine. And like a lot of Chinese strategic thinkers have publicly stated, if Russia stands to fall, wouldn't China be the next? From the very beginning of the war, the United States has tried to uh, shape the narrative of China being Russia's accomplice, enabler, and supporter. And unfortunately, I think this positioning has played a role of self-fulfilling prophecy on China. Even if China had considered that it might need to adopt a more neutral and a more objective policy in the Ukraine war, even just for the sake of China's relationship with Europe, the um, some of the US policy actions have uh, terminated those possibilities. And one example that the Chinese diplomats will always refer to in private is uh, US sabotage of China's position at the Munich Security Forum in February of last year. So you might remember at this summit, Chinese foreign minister, uh, well, Chinese Politburo member Wang Yi, his original intention was to gain Europeans' understanding of China's position on the issue of Ukraine and potentially adjust China's position. But he was preempted by uh, Secretary of State Blinken, who announced publicly that China was going to provide lethal weapons to, uh, to Russia. So that act once and for all defined China as accomplice of Russia, and it has also cost China its room for maneuver. So since then, I think the Chinese have become much more solid in terms of its, uh, in terms of its position and support of Russia because China didn't see itself as having a choice. Until now, China has not provided direct lethal weapon, uh, le weapons and military aid to Russia. But China's support for Russia has manifested itself in at least three uh, dimensions. The first one is revenue creation. We know that China has imported a significant amount of oil from Russia, 24% of increase in terms of volume in the year of 2023, and this has created more revenue support for the Russian government. The second aspect is uh, dual-use technology and dual-use products, including civilian products that can be used in the war, such as parts for helicopters, as well as parts and technology for drones. The third aspect of the Chinese support is uh, what Washington has been paying an increasing amount of attention to, which is China's support of the Russian defense industry base, including the supply of materials, technologies, parts to increase or consolidate Russia's ability to produce weapons. And China has benefited handsomely from this process. Other than maintaining or protecting the survival and development of an important strategic partner, uh, China has strengthened its strategic contacts with Russia, but at the same time, the war in the short term has not been a financial loss for China. In 2023, we know that the bilateral trade between China and Russia has reached the record 240 billion US dollars, a 26% uh, increase from the previous year. So uh, Russia suddenly became the number four largest trading partner of China, right after uh, US, Japan, and South Korea. And also in 2023, Russia exported 107 million tons of crude oil to China, or 24% in terms of the volume. And Russia suddenly became, um, well not suddenly, because China, uh, Russia used to be the number two largest oil supplier to China, now it is the number one. Um, China is not only, has not only used the opportunity to increase its own strategic reserve, it is also engaged in massive arbitrage to export the Russian crude oil to, uh, to re-export the Russian oil to Europe. Russia has used the Ukraine war and the financial sanctions that Russia is under to develop a separate alternative 
transaction system that is independent from SWIFT. In 2023, the um, trade, the, tran the payment in terms of bilateral trade in uh, Chinese currency RMB and the Russian rubles increased significantly from 20% in 2020 to almost 95%, according to uh, senior Russian officials. So in 2023, the declaration from both Russia and China is that the two countries have already uh, basically got rid of third country currency, aka US dollars or, uh, or the euros, in their, um, in their bilateral transactions. So of course, using RMB as a transaction currency does not necessarily increase the potential for uh, the RMB's utility as a reserve currency. But in fact, what has happened within the past two years in this domain is China is using the opportunity to experiment and test with a parallel system in the event that China in the future might be subject to similar international financial sanctions. Even if that parallel system is not able to replace or displace the current SWIFT system, the Chinese testing of that alternative system is extremely important for China's own preparation for a potential Taiwan contingency. Between China and Russia, the war in Ukraine significantly increased the power balance between the two. And like Alex mentioned, this uh, image of Russia being junior partner in the bilateral relationship, I'm sure the Russians do not agree, but the Chinese inevitably have developed a deeper sense of a, a sense of superiority. So what has changed the most in China in the past two years about China-Russia relations or about Russia itself is China's assessment and attitude towards Russia, something I call the disillusionment about Russia. From the protracted war of uh, attrition in Ukraine, two of the previous Chinese beliefs about Russia are validated and reconfirmed. One, Russia is a country torn between great power ambition and the lack of great power capability. Two, Russia is a destructive power rather than a constructive power and uses the strategy of chaos to serve its own policy agenda. What China has been disillusioned of from the war in Ukraine is quite significant. For China, there has been a reassessment of Russia's military power and strategic capability. While China used to believe that Russia under Putin has superior military strategies and capabilities, the reality of the Ukraine war has demonstrated many weaknesses of the Russian military, including resources, mobilization, training, morale, technology. The only inevitable conclusion in China is that, well, maybe Russia is not a strong military power as China believed. Meanwhile, the Chinese have also begun to challenge the conventional wisdom in China that Russia is the ultimate master of strategy, extremely adept in using diplomatic maneuver, maneuver strategic manipulation, hybrid warfare, um, in order to use its strategic capability to punch above its weight. What Beijing used to look up to Russia, now it is disillusioned by Putin's lack of preparation, preparedness for the war, lack of resources in many ways, and the options to navigate the way out of the quagmire. This assessment has also led to some interesting uh, attitude, attitudinal change, or a gradual shift toward a, um, a more superiority complex in, Russia, uh, in China towards Russia on a bilateral level. The sense of sympathy still lingers, especially considering the Chinese sympathetic defense of Russia about NATO e expansion. But for the Chinese, NATO expansion might make the war by Russia justifiable. But Russia's losing the war, and embarrassing China, is not. Like the Chinese have said from the beginning of the war, the bigger crime than starting a war is to start a war and lose it. China will not abandon Russia. We talked about this. Even Russia loses in the Ukraine war, China will build Russia up because Russia remains a useful instrument in China's effort to counter the United States. While Russia has been called China's junior partner for some time, the legacy of Sovietization in China has consistently had its psychological impact over the Chinese leadership, especially the current leadership and its population, coloring their judgment about Russia's strengths and weaknesses in a pro-Russia direction. The war in Ukraine might in fact be a psychological turning point and we will observe very closely whether the Chinese disillusionment about Russia in the future is going to have a major impact over the bilateral relations. In the Chinese policy community, there is a very vivid description of China-Russia relations. 
which is China and Russia can share sufferings, but not happiness. Despite the fact that um, the war in Ukraine has significantly advanced and promoted the relationship between China and Russia in reality, but every story has another darker side. So for example, although the partnership between China and Russia has advanced significantly, but the two countries still do not see eye to eye on a number of issues. Russia has not accepted China's 12 point position on the, uh, on the conflict in Ukraine. China has openly expressed its opposition to the use of nuclear weapons. Although the bilateral relationship has, uh, has, has increased, but Russia's attitude towards Chinese population in Russia and towards Chinese tourism, tourists going to Russia make it very difficult to believe that these are the, a good reflection of the political friendship between the two countries. Although the energy trade between China and Russia has advanced significantly, but data do not lie. In 2023, we talk about the volume of Chinese import of Russian crude oil increased by 24%, but the total value increased by only 3.5%. So what does that mean? So it means that the Russian crude oil price has been significantly suppressed compared to before. Uh, in, the many, in the past couple of years, Russia has been pushing China to adopt and to implement the Power Siberia 2 pipeline project in order to increase the natural gas uh, LNG export to China. But China has been dragging its feet, and to this date, there has not been a firm decision. On the most in important endogenous factor of the bilateral relationship, energy cooperation, China and Russia do not share the same future. What the Chinese are ultimately pursuing is um, carbon, emission, uh, carbon emission peak by 2035 and the carbon neutrality by 2060. What it means is that in the long run, if we look down another 15, 20 years, China's demand for oil and gas is going to decrease. China's economic future lies in new technology, new energy resources, renewable energy resources, high-tech um, semiconductor chips, and in this domain, Russia has almost zero leverage. And before China reaches the uh, carbon emission peak, Ukraine war might be a long, might be a short-term beneficial um, event for China's geopolitics. But in the long run, the Chinese see it as a negative development. In the short term, China gets to exploit Russia's. Um, Russia's cheaply priced energy resources. But in the long run, the war in Ukraine, to the Chinese biggest fear, is going to create the bipolarization of the global energy market, which means that US will export energy to Europe and Russia will export energy to China. And the lack of diversification means a significant risk for China's security, uh, energy security and the future. So any uh, arrangement that goes against the diversification of energy market is not in line with the, with the future that China desires. If we look at the paradigm of the China-Russia uh, China relations, this relationship has always been motivated by, was a, the, um, the alignment between China and Russia has always been motivated by external factors. So how to resolve the issue of lacking internal momentum or internal motivation for the bilateral relationship has been a long existing challenge for both China and mostly China and at the same time Russia. So the respective threat that the US and the West or the perception of that threat from US and the West on China and Russia is a fundamental cause for the continued and deepening alignment between China and Russia. The war in Ukraine has continued and also deepened the alignment and the cooperation between China and Russia. But ironically, if you follow China's policy towards the United States and US-China relations, ironically, in 2017, when President Trump first became the president, the biggest uncertain factor was the uncertainty in Sino-US relationship was Trump's potential to improve relations with Russia. And we have seen a number of policy elaborations from the Chinese strategic thinkers on this, on this particular danger. So if China-Russia relationship is lacking external, uh, is lacking internal momentum or internal motivation, um, what will potentially create the real and the fundamental changes to this relationship may not be lying from within. And that basically illustrates to what Washington's policy choice in the foreseeable future will be.
So I will stop there and look forward to uh, Sergey's enlightenment and discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, organizing this, for, for, for hosting uh, this lecture, and for this very interesting collaboration between the two institutes, uh, the two you, Weatherhead Institute and the Herman Institute. Which, which one is responsible for weather? I assume it's the what is it <laughs> anyway um, I am I'm very glad to be here uh, I have been to Columbia University before uh, but mainly as a visitor I've never done an actual presentation here uh, so it's a, a special honor for me um, uh, there's something that ties me to Harriman Institute uh, and that is uh, the Harriman Institute was named after um, Everell Herman, who was a prominent uh, was governor of New York, uh, American diplomat. Uh, and I have such appreciation for Everell Herman that my son's middle name is actually Everell. Can you believe that? So you have to, you, you, your father have, has to be a Cold War historian to, to, you know, to, give, uh, uh, to give you uh, a middle name that is uh, Everell after Errol, Everell Herman. But that's the extent of my connection. So I'm, I'm very pleased that I'm here to deepen our uh, connection. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I, it's, it's a very tough act actually to follow such a wonderful, wonderful structured presentation. I have to uh, say that I agree with many of the things that uh, you already pointed out in her presentation, which was on the skeptical side on the spectrum between you know, or China and Russia are uh, best friends forever, and China and Russia are actually, uh, there's a marriage of convenience, or what's the term that is sometimes used to describe them. So I will, in my uh, uh, presentation, uh, highlight a few things about how the Russians view this relationship. It, it has to be said before everything else that this is obviously a long relationship, a historically long relationship that goes back uh, to the 17th century. Um, and this is a relationship that has seen ups and downs. I was born in a little village on the border between uh, China and then the Soviet Union, the river that uh, it was a village on the bank of River Usuri, uh, which of course was well known in 1969 as a, as a site of a, a major confrontation between China and the Soviet Union. In fact, they basically went to war. It was an undeclared war. Things got so bad that the Soviets were dropping hints of a preemptive nuclear strike. I don't think they really meant it. I think they just want to, wanted to scare the Chinese a little bit, but also signal to the United States. I think they signaled in the wrong way because, of course, afterwards, the Americans understood that there was an exploitable gap there between the two countries, and they better get in. Of course, Henry Kissinger uh, was uh, the pioneer of this particular, particular policy. So by the time that I was born uh, in this little village, uh, on the Sino-Russian border, uh, China and Russia were basically in a state of a cold war, a really, really cold war. Um, you could not communi communicate across the border, and nobody would have thought back then, we're talking late 70s, early 80s, that um, uh, the relationship would improve so quickly as it did in the late 1980s. Of course, we know that in 1989, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, travel to Beijing, and together with Deng Xiaoping, they proclaimed this relationship that was supposed to close the past and open the future. Overlapped, of course, with the events in Tiananmen Square, kind of. Gorbachev was there in mid-May 1989. The events in Tiananmen Square happened a little bit more the, the uh, I guess, the brutal highlight of this events happened a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Uh, which is, by the way, an interesting point, because uh, few people think about Mikhail Gorbachev as being the pioneer of uh, Sino-Russian relations. That actually highlights how deeply this relationship goes today. When we talk about a partnership today between China and Russia, this is not something that Xi Jinping and Putin brought 
together. This is something that already was there. It was starting to come together, starting from the mid 1980s. Uh, although I don't know exactly, and this is a good question about what, what actually happened in the 1980s that, that brought those two countries out of their state of confrontation towards uh, something that resembled a normalization and then eventually even a closer relationship, even as Russia also embraced, embraced the West in the 1990s. Uh, if I were to name one reason, historians don't like this, historians like multiple reasons, but if I were to name one reason in the 1980s, this was the idea that, uh, that the policymakers in Moscow got that actually the Chinese were not so bad compared to the Americans. Now, the relationship with the United States was pretty bad following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. There was basically isolation of the Soviet Union and Europe. And so from that perspective, looking at China, they thought, why are, you know, what is the point? What is the point? Let's see if we can actually improve our relationship with the Chinese on a non-ideological basis. Stop arguing about ideology. Just be pragmatic about this relationship. See what we can do. And I think Deng Xiaoping also did the same thing, more or less. He understood that uh, the United States had played China as a card. Um, and thought that this was a bad thing for China. So therefore, China needed options. Therefore, turning towards the Soviet Union was actually a good idea. So we have this process that led uh, to Gorbachev's visit in 1989, uh, but then ultimately towards the uh, kind of relationship that we have today between China and Russia, which I agree with you is probably best explained or called not an alliance, because it is not an alliance by any stretch of imagination, but an alignment where the two sides' interests overlap in crucial areas, and I'll talk about that in a second, but also the two sides uh, reserve considerable room for disagreement, and that also exists, and Yun has already talked about it. So what will then I talk about? I'll talk about uh, the Sino-Soviet, uh, Sino-Soviet, Sino-Russian, I'm still stuck in history, as you can see. Um, I've just finished a big book uh, on the Cold War. It's called To Run the World, uh, where I look at how uh, the Soviets pursued their foreign policy since the 1940s. And because I, I've been doing book talks a lot, I, I, keep, I keep confusing the Soviet Union and Russia, which is something you're not supposed to do as a historian, right? But I keep doing this. So I apologize for that ahead of time if I keep, if I keep, uh, if I keep saying Sino-Soviet instead of Sino-Russian. I also blame the jet lag. Um, um, uh, anyway, so the three angles that I wanted to briefly talk about are A, the relationship between societies, and that is a little bit difficult to pin down, but I'll explain what I mean by that. Then the relationship between elites, and I'll focus in particular on the question of ideology here. And thirdly, and lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the relationship between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. The relationship between societies. You know, it is much more difficult to turn societies around compared to making political decisions. So when Vladimir Putin embraced this idea of turning towards, call it the global south, you know, China, something out there, it was easy to say politically, but how do you bring a society around to embrace the same ideas? It has been extremely difficult. Now, of course, in Russia, there has been a long debate. Those of you who are historians of Russia would know that even going back 200 years, there was already a debate in Russia uh, about whether Russia is a European power. This is an idea that was advanced by your files, or whether it is, in fact, uh, uh, something else, a special civilization. The Slavophiles were advancing this idea of a special role, special civilization for Russia. But there's one thing that was definitely absent, definitely absent in this debate 200 years ago, and it's also absent today, and that is the idea that Russia is an Asian country. Nobody will embrace this idea. In other words, in cultural terms, Russia is very much trying to figure out whether it's actually a European or whether it is something else, but certainly it does not see itself as an Asian country. And even that is even true for people like myself, those people who were born and grew up. I mean, I grew up on the island of Sakhalin in the Russian Far East. Uh, nine hours from Moscow by airplane, very far. You know what's close? Japan is very close. And we actually had Japanese broadcasts. Uh, which is how I learned about the outside world as a kid. We had Japanese cartoons 
Nobody could understand anything, but we tuned in because this was in a, a world out there. But still, the tendency for most people was to look west and not to look to Asia. There was a distant relationship with Asia. There was no real sense that culturally Russia belonged there. There was, on the other hand, the sense, the sense that uh, culturally uh, Russia very much belonged to Europe. Has this changed at all since Putin's so-called special military operation? I would argue not at all. It hasn't changed. In fact, still very much Russia, even today, is oriented in its narratives towards the West. And China is a decidedly second a player there. How do we know that? Well, try to tune into, well, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't recommend this, but if you watch Russian news, okay, you know, open a Russian website, their state media website, I do that as a matter of uh, professional curiosity, you'll see that there's not a lot actually about China most of the time. The Russian audiences, Russian narratives are interested in what's happening in the West. They're interested in events uh, in the United Kingdom, for example. They're absolutely obsessed by the UK. There's this uh, fixation in Russia on the Anglo-Saxons, but particular, in particular on the British, who are seen the, as the mighty you know, hidden hand behind everything that happens and that is, that is bad for Russia. I think that goes back to the 19th century, at least, this kind of a strange uh, fixation, obsession. Um, a couple of years, a couple, a couple of uh, days ago, I was watching uh, the Russian uh, uh, news, and there was something there about the healthcare system in the UK. In the expected direction, as in you know, oh, the UK is falling apart, the healthcare is, is horrible, partly true. Uh, <laughs> Not all propaganda. Um, you know, before that, they had a story about how uh, how the king has died. It turned out to be fake news promoted by Russian there. But they were absolutely obsessed by that. Oh, the king has died. You know, anything that happens in the UK, they're really paying a lot of attention. Are they paying attention to what's happening in China? Try reading Russian news. There's nothing there about what's happening in China. Nobody knows. Nobody knows anything. Why is that? Because there's no, there's no interest. There's no interest among the educated elites who would, uh, you know, people, the journalists, you know, there's no language expertise. Uh, they're, still, they're still fixated on what's happening in, in, in Europe. There's been so much discussion in the Russian media about Macron. They're just, they're obsessing about Macron. There's very little about, let's say, Vietnam, or Japan, South Korea, China even, even China. Um, now, you might argue against this and you might say, well, still there's a shift. There has been a noticeable shift in the sense that there are more Russians now who are traveling to China. Uh, for example, students are coming in greater numbers than ever before, uh, partly because the opportunities have been close to them in the West. They don't know where to go, so they go to China. And maybe in the longer term, this will actually mean something significant. I don't see this having an impact just yet. And you know, I don't know why this is. Uh, maybe it's the Chinese language is difficult to learn. Maybe it's just, you know, this Chinese society is not the kind of society that is so easy to integrate in two, as it were. And so you don't see this kind of interpersonal relationships that had formed between, let's say, Russians and Europeans. You know, joint families, um, you know, children living in Europe, even though their parents are Z patriots and are you know, uh, standing behind Putin, et cetera. So this is a very interesting factor, which I think was also there, by the way, uh, during the Sino-Soviet uh, alliance in the 1950s. Uh, this was supposed to be unbreakable eternal alliance. By the way, at personal level, uh, there was limited interaction. Yes, uh, something like you know, 10,000 Chinese students went to study in the Soviet Union, and that mattered. That mattered, and you talked about it, how this still has some kind of relevance even today. Um, on the other hand, uh, where there are really close interactions, I don't think there ever were particularly close interactions at the, at the society to society level. Now, one area where there has been, and you has already talked about this, where there has, has been a closer interaction, and really Russia's, uh, Russia embracing of China is the economic field. And that is very important, and that is actually crucial for any conversation about the direction of Sino-Russian relationship. Uh, 
while we talk about politics, people sometimes tend to ignore economics. And economics matters. And economics matters in the sense that you know, these are ties that bind these two countries together. It's not just political proclamations. It is actual money. It is actual, Yun has cited the figure, uh, $240 billion. Uh, this year, significant, of course, we cannot see a uh, much greater increase in this uh, volume simply because what happened this year is largely a result of Russia reorienting some of its trade simply because of sanctions. They have not been able to um, direct some of their exports or obtain as many imports as they could from Europe and the West. So they're redirecting that to China. But nevertheless, this is a real important factor um, uh, because these two economies are not in competition fundamentally. They are mutually complementary. Um, uh, the, the Russians are selling China the stuff that China largely needs, for now at least, as we have heard, i.e. energy. Um, and the, the Russians are getting from China what they desperately need, i.e., uh, if you look at the trade statistics for uh, last year, you will see some of the biggest items of Russia's imports from China are, guess what? Cars. Cars. Why? Because the Russians, you know, they, they, they don't have a very good car industry. And so they need to get their cars from somewhere. Of course, we know that getting cars from the West has been a problem for them. So they are getting cars from China in quantities that you would not, well, some of, you know, some of those cars may, are not, may not be of the kind that Russians would prefer, uh, all things being equal, and if opportunities open to them to get cars from, from Germany, maybe they, would, they still would. But given you know, that they can't do that, yes, they'll turn to China, they'll get cars from China, they will get phones from China. So another major item are mobile phones. Um, and we're talking billions of dollars. Billions of dollars are coming in um, so this is very profitable for China. Yun has already talked about the export of energy, and I will not say much more about this, except that you can, of course, now see, given that China publishes its statistics, which is something that Russia has not done, custom statistics. Russia has basically closed down the, the numbers, but now using the Chinese custom statistic, which you can see, you can see the discount, which the Chinese have been getting Russian energy at. It's a substantial discount, I think, also in, the, in, 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 in something like eight or nine billion dollars since the price, oil price cap was implemented. So this is a very profitable relationship, certainly for Xi Jinping. You know, Putin doesn't really have options. Uh, and yes, he may be frustrated about this. Yeah, and we've seen that in particular with the power of Siberia 2 conversation. The Russians have proclaimed it. It's, it's a done deal, it's a done deal. They've already promised Mongolia that this pipeline will go through Mongolia. The Mongolians have been happy saying, oh, we'll get this pipeline. Nothing has happened, nothing's happened. Even if you go to the previous power of Siberia, power of Siberia one, the deal that was son, signed in May uh, 2014, it only took Putin's personal intervention be before the Chinese agreed to that. And now even Putin's personal intervention has failed to deliver. The Chinese know that they have Russians against the wall and they're negotiating for a better price, and that means that Russia has fairly limited leverage. So yes, the economic relationship matters, uh, but there, there, the story is certainly not straightforward. There, uh, uh, it's, there, there are pluses and minuses to this relationship. Right, so this is the society to society relationship. Now let me talk a little bit about the Elites, and this is where it becomes complicated because the, even the question of elites raises question. Further question: What are who are these elites that we're talking about? Are they business elites, political elites? When I talk about elites, I basically talk, in Russia's case, about uh, people around Putin, Siloviki, you know, people who are uh, making foreign policy or contributing to foreign policy in some shape or form. Who's the actual maker of the foreign policy? I don't know, you might argue it's very centralized and Putin basically calls all the shots. Maybe the elites don't matter at all. That's why when we impose sanctions against Russian oligarchs, the Russian oligarchs reasonably said, well, what do we have to do with this? You know, we have nothing to do with this. We have no influence whatsoever. They're not wrong. Um, but you know, if you look at these people around Putin, people like, for example, Patrushev, who is, who's, uh, um, you know, I, I like to depict, depict the you know, circle in this way. Some people, I think, are um, cynical, 
um, opportunists. So people like Dmitry Medvedev, a former president, who of course we know has now turned into this crazy hawk calling for daily destruction of the West you know, with nuclear weapons. And you read it, you think, okay, is, you know, is he crazy or is he just trying to survive? And he's just you know, uh, cynically adopting this language. I think it's the latter. I think people like uh, Medvedev, he's certainly not the only one, are people who don't really deeply believe in this what Putin is peddling. They just have no choice. You, know, you have to survive in the system. You have to basically, um, uh, to live with wolves, you have to howl like a wolf. But there, to use a Russian proverb, but there, um, there are also others like Patrushev, who I think are genuinely crazy. Okay, they're genuinely crazy. Uh, you read the interviews, you see the consistency over the years, you realize these people are deeply, there's something wrong with their, something was, uh, something has gone off the rails in their heads, uh, and so they see the West in this most um, uh, obsessive black and white terms. It's either us or them. You know, we have to prevail. This is a struggle unto death, etc. Um, but what is the ideology in the end? What is the ideology? How does it relate? to anything that the Chinese are doing. And this is where we run into problems, because the Chinese, unarguably, do have an ideology. Um, it's formulated in party documents. Uh, we may ask questions to what extent the Chinese party officials actually believe in, in their various proclamations. If you ask you know, Kevin Rudd, for example, he'll tell you that's absolutely true. Whatever they say is, is absolutely what they believe. Uh, about Marxism, Leninism, et cetera, et cetera. None of that applies to Russia. None of that applies to Russia. Um, the only commonality in ideologies, if you can put it this way, between China and Russia, is the, uh, this obsession with the West, this idea, especially with the United States, this idea that the United States should be dislodged from its place of at the top of the international hierarchy. In other words, uh, there's, in, in other areas, there's very, very little commonality. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I would argue that's actually a good thing for the relationship. Because remember what happened the last time that China and, at that time, the Soviet Union had a common ideology. If you have a common ideology, you immediately, there's immediately a question of who's going to interpret What's, what actually works in, this, in the context of this ideology and what doesn't. Because you know, back then, in the 1950s, there were party organizations, party committees, uh, ideolo ideology departments. There's still one in, in China, not in Russia. But they were, they were interpreting the Marxist-Leninist doctrine and saying, OK, this is what it is. Everybody follow us. And this is arguably one of the reasons that the Sino-Soviet alliance disintegrated in the 1950s, because the Chinese were not willing to put up with the Soviet interpretation of the ideology. They thought, no, we have our own interpretation. Why is it that we have to follow you? Um, the alliance, because it was so tightly bound together by ideological dogma, it was such a tight alliance, it proved extremely fragile. Whereas today, the relationship is actually very flexible precisely because there is no ideology except for some kind of vague opposition to American hegemony. Um, and it doesn't even go beyond that. Okay, you know, if, there's, if, if let's say America is displaced from its position of international leadership, are they going to agree, Russia and China between themselves, who's going to run the world? And you think if the Chinese run the world, Russia, the Russians will say, oh, we like this, we like this. Please take this place. They're not going to be happy about this, right? They're not going to be happy about this. So it's much more about displacing the United States from Russian perspective, creating the situation of uncertainty with lots of players vying for uh, positions in the global system. It's not about putting China in charge or for China. Never mind for China putting Russia in charge. Nobody sane will entertain this idea in Beijing. And this is good for the relationship in the sense that they don't have shared goals in this regard. They don't have, uh, they don't have this ideological glue that would hold them together. I'll give you one interesting example how, a, how ideology and a you know, close alliance may make the uh, relationship more fragile. Think back to 1959. In 1959, China and India developed a border conflict 
Okay, still festering, we know. This is one of the problems in, in the Sino-Indian relationship. But back then, um, back then, the Moscow looked at it and thought, well, it's really pain that they have this because the Chinese are our brothers, but the Indians, they're our friends. We're trying to have a good relationship with New Delhi. We don't want to take China's side. We just want to, so in this, they did. They proclaimed neutrality in the Sino-Indian border conflict. The Chinese were outraged. They accused Moscow of betrayal. And they were, actually, they were right because there was an alliance between Moscow and Beijing. So by the terms of the alliance, the Russians were supposed to back Beijing against India. And when the Russians said, well, sorry, we're neutral. Mao was outraged. He felt that this was a betrayal. Now, project to the present day. Today, again, we have a fairly difficult relationship between uh, China and India. Maybe it hasn't come to the kind of ten tension that we had in between 1959 and 1962, but still. Suppose it does come to it. Will Beijing expect Russia to side with it in a conflict with India? It's a good question. That if you ask, if you probe this question, it tells us a lot about where this relationship is going, what it actually means for both countries. I would argue that it would be very, very difficult for Russia today to side with China against India for a variety of reasons. And I think Beijing will accept this. They will accept this because they feel that, look, they don't have so many friends and partners on the international stage, and um, they'll need to placate Russia and just say, okay, well, if you don't want to back us, fine. Now, if Beijing tried to push Moscow into backing Chinese positions on this, then I think we could see some serious problems developing in this relationship. But for the, for the time being, we don't see this coming from Beijing. We don't see the coercion. We don't see uh, Beijing trying to order Moscow about, uh, which, by the way, is very different from the way that the Sino-Soviet relationship worked in the 1950s. Arguably, one of the reasons that it fell apart was because the Soviets were constantly trying to pressure China to back China on international issues. The Chinese were saying, you know, we have our own position. Why is it that you're pressuring us? But the, the Soviets thought, well, we are the boss of the international communist movement. You're supposed to follow us. Today, China is not doing this. We're not doing this. With, we're not seeing this with China. Uh, so, another interesting question. If China, you know, we don't know whether this will happen, but suppose a conflict erupted over Taiwan. Would there be an expectation in Beijing that Russia backs China in the invasion of Taiwan? I don't know there would be much of an expectation that this were to happen. If this were to happen, you know, if, 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 if it came to, I don't think Russia would actually contribute much. I think Beijing would accept it. So those are the real limitations, uh, and they show that not having an ideology to this relationship is actually fundamentally a good thing. Finally, the personal relationship between Putin and Xi Jinping. This, is, this has been cited time and again as a super important reason for why this relationship is holding together so well. They have met each other you know, 40 times. Uh, they supposedly trust one another and so on and so forth. I would not take this too far. If you're a dictator in charge of an authoritarian state, you don't trust anyone, least of all other authoritarian dictators. And we do not see a real friendship between Putin and Xi Jinping. I mean, who, who are we to judge whether there is a really good personal relationship? I mean, we can, of course, uh, cite examples with, let's say, Putin's relationship with Schroeder, you know, how they went to sauna together or something, and you know, uh, you know the story where they went to the sauna and the sauna burned down or something, and you know, Putin said, okay, they were drinking beer together in the sauna, and you know, there are all kinds of stories like that going back to early 2000s. Can you imagine Putin and Xi Jinping going, sharing a sauna and drinking beer together? It just doesn't have, it just doesn't, you cannot square it in your head. It doesn't work. And in fact, when you see Putin and Xi Jinping meeting, uh, you see something of a bit of a tension. Of course, you know, language barrier is one of this, but you always see that there's a distance between them. And I don't know, yeah, you can't say that they trust, they only trust each other as far as their interests coincide. And I think there's a clear understanding in both sides that they will not go out on a limb for one another. And we have seen plenty of this in the economic relationship, again, going back 
to um, power of Siberia too. Nevertheless, and I'll conclude with this, it is hugely important to take the personal, pers in the, in the personal relationship into account because uh, these relationships do matter in the end. Consider the uh, relationship between Stalin and Mao Zedong in, in the 1950s and the, the rise of the uh, Sino-Soviet alliance. How much did this relationship matter to the alliance? Of course it mattered a great deal. By the way, Mao Zedong never liked Stalin. He hated Stalin, but he deferred to Stalin. He was willing to defer to Stalin because he felt that Stalin was an important figure. He, he treated him sort of like a distant father. Once Stalin was out of the way, uh, this kind of relationship did not develop between Mao Zedong and Khrushchev. In fact, Mao Zedong thought that Khrushchev was a preposterous clown and that he really was not entitled to lead. Um, he, you know, he, he did not have the kind of uh, accomplishments in, uh, to his record as Stalin had uh, in, in, in his time. Uh, and, and so, uh, and we can see that this being, you know, of course, one of the reasons why the uh, Sino-Soviet relationship deteriorated to the point of an utmost confrontation by the late 1960s. Mao was really important to this. His personal outlook on the world, his, his personal hatred of the Soviet Union, um, his personal propensity to spread chaos, by the way, it's a very interesting parallel can be made between uh, Putin today and what you've mentioned, you know, about chaos, this idea of spreading chaos. And Mao Zedong in the 1960s, you know, all under the heaven is great chaos. It's, you know, that's Mao and that's Putin today. This idea that you can spread chaos and make some gains from this. So there's some parallel there. But, but Mao certainly hated uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a very interesting episode in the, in the early 1970s when Nikolai Ceausescu of Romania turned up in Beijing and said, why do you keep quarreling with the Soviets? You're already improving your relationship with the United States. Can't you just try to improve your relationship, relationship with, with Moscow? And you know what Mao said? Mao said, um, uh, they keep pissing on my head. He was deeply personally upset what, 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 what was happening in this relationship. Ultimately, it took Mao's death in 1976 before the relationship actually could be steered back towards because Deng Xiaoping did not have this kind of personal commitment to quarrel with the Soviet Union. He didn't have that. Um, today, this relationship between Putin and Xi Jinping is, I would say, different from the relationship between Mao and Stalin or Mao and later Soviet leaders in the sense that it seems that, that, uh, that, that Xi Jinping is not prepared to order Putin about. Now, you might say he's got the economic leverage to do so, and sometimes he drops hints. Like, for example, he dropped his hint about China not being very happy if, they, say, the Russians used atomic weapons in Ukraine. He dropped those hints. By the way, I don't think it matters at all that he drops those hints. If it comes to using nuclear weapons in Ukraine, it's not going, Putin is not going to turn to Xi Jinping and say, Comrade Xi Jinping, he now calls him Comrade, you know, what do you think about this? No. Because it's a last, last uh, weapon of last resort. If he has to use it, he will use it. He's not going to turn to the Chinese. By the same token, by the way, when uh, Putin started this invasion, he did not consult with Xi Jinping. There goes your very close personal relationship, relationship of trust. He did not even consult with him, did not even tell him that there would be this invasion. Uh, in, in any case, Xi Jinping has been very careful in not pushing Putin too far. Why is that? It's dis and this is interesting, an interesting uh, factor of this relationship. China has a huge economic leverage over Russia, but it's simply unwilling to exploit it in order to force Russia, to coerce Russia to take action that it prefers. In other words, it's unusable leverage. It's very much unusable leverage. Uh, because, you know, you use it, you lose it. Uh, and what, will, what, what, what good will it do to China to break up this relationship with Russia or to frustrate Putin to, to a point where there's a break between China and Russia? And here's the final point. There's one thing that China and Russia have learned from their long period of confrontation. In 19, it started in the late 1950s and then went through the 1960s. They understand that, and I think it applies to both sides, certainly applies to, to the Russians. They understand that every time there's a break in this relationship, 
when the relationship goes sour, this only allows third parties to exploit this relationship. So they will go out of their way to try to smooth out the corners in the relationship in order to maintain it on a positive trajectory. And I don't think it's a question of Putin versus Xi Jinping. I think it's a question of the strategic outlook of the elites in both countries. And I would expect this to continue into the future for the foreseeable future. Thank you. So we'll, we'll move into the Q&A part. I would encourage you to line up behind the mic there if you have a question. I want to start us off um, going to, to you first. Um, we, we, we talked a bit about the, the, the kind of uh, exasperation um, um, that China had and some of the ways that Russia has handled the conflict and, and some of the frustrations. Um, but now um, that clearly they don't want Russia to quote unquote lose or, or fail. Um, what would be the ideal outcome from Beijing's perspective, right? If Beijing could script an outcome to the war in Ukraine, the post-conflict settlement, and the world order around it, right? What would be the ideal for Beijing? That is a great question. Um, I was asked by this. Uh, I was asked by a by, by, by a reporter. What is Beijing's worst case scenario in the war of Ukraine? It's the opposite of what you are asking. Yeah. What, what is Beijing's most desired scenario? And when I was thinking really hard, the worst case scenario for China is actually not Russia losing. But Russia has a change of mind and decides to align its position with the United States. <laughs> that will be the worst case scenario, worst outcome for China, period. Um, but coming to what would be the best case scenario, I think the Chinese have already made their strategic alignment choice very clear that they want to align with Russia. So by that token, it means it does not want, China, want Russia to look another way, which means that China does not want Russia to have the strategic luxury out of this war to change its position or change its relationship with the West, especially the United States. So to keep Russia weakened, so China, so China can exploit this relationship, but now so weakened that Russia becomes a liability. <laughs> so it's a, it's a delicate balance. Interesting. And then Sergey, I ask you to comment on that. Um, obviously, uh, uh, they're both officially for a multipolar world. We see the pivot to the east yet again, and you've poked a lot of holes into that. Um, what would be the ideal outcome from Moscow's perspective? Not the conflict in Ukraine, um, or comment on that, but their relationship with Beijing afterwards? Uh, so, um, uh, the yeah, first, on the, on the question of, of China, actually, I think I, I, I would agree with you completely. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about China is the Chinese have always been very, very pragmatic. They've, all been, they've been, always been very pragmatic when it comes to Russia. Um, uh, in 1991, they supported the coup against Gorbachev, one of the few countries that did so. Um, uh, then, like three days later, the coup collapsed. They recalled their ambassador, who was meeting with the coup leaders. And okay, okay, that's fine. You know, we're building a good relationship now with Russia. So, whatever happens to Russia, even if Russia fell apart, you know, the Chinese will embrace this as a, just a reality and try to establish relationship with you know Russia's parts, for this matter. But obviously, this would not be a desirable scenario from Chinese perspective. I agree with you that actually the uh, uh, much more interesting perspective from there uh, uh, or uh, scenario from their position would be to have a frozen conflict because in a frozen situation you have uh, the Russians are not able to uh, build on any leverage vis-a-vis -vis Europe or the West in order to then turn to China and exercise this leverage vis-a-vis -vis China. In other words, the Russians have put themselves into a corner 
the very historically very interesting uh, comparison can be made to the Korean War when the when the when Stalin got the Chinese to get involved in the Korean War. One of the reasons was that they could not then turn to the West as a result because the relation with the United States was so bad, and that suited Stalin just fine. And now Xi Jinping, of course, he did not get Russia. He was not his decision to send Russia into Ukraine, but he benefits from the situation where Russia's relationship with the West is effectively effectively severe. But from Russia's perspective, it doesn't make sense long term. And this is where we uh, come to this uh, question of what actually serves Russia's national interests. Uh, it doesn't serve Russia's national interests to be, uh, to be kind of a uh, 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 almost, I don't want to say vassal state, but you get my idea, to China, to be subservient to Beijing. Nobody in Moscow thinks that. You might say that Putin recently in some of his comments suggested this was not such a bad idea. He did on one occasion. He said that maybe this was, you know, hinted at the idea that this was not so bad. But fundamentally, I think Russian elites understand that being subservient to China is not a good idea. What they're really hoping for, and this is, by the way, of course, that actually underlines Putin's strategic mistake by shutting, burning his bridges with the West. He now has so little leverage to turn, you know, do anything with China. We can see that in economic relations, with gas relations. You know, we see it everywhere. We see that Putin, by burning his bridges with the West, he, he put himself just at China's uh, disposal, um, uh, which, um, uh, which is you know, tr truly tragic from the perspective of Russia's long-term national interests. So what the Russians will want to do in the long term, I think, is to get themselves out of this situation and uh, somehow rebuild their relationship with the West. But they understand that it cannot be done right now. What they're hoping to do is, if they win in Ukraine, or bring this war, claw their way to something like a victory, then the Europeans will eventually come around to acknowledge this reality and say, OK, well, fine, we just have to accept this reality and rebuild the relationship with Russia on a new basis, which will give much greater prominence to Russia, uh, in, in certainly in European affairs. And if the United States obliges just by withdrawing from Europe in the meantime, all the better. This is great. Uh, but this is their kind of long-term hope. They're hoping that they'll be able to rebuild some of this leverage that they used to have in Europe so that they escape from this one-sided reliance on China. How long will it take? I don't know, but I think it's still part of their strategic vision. Great, thank you. Okay, let's take a question. Just please introduce yourselves. Yes, uh, my name is Jim Dingman. I'm from Pacifica Radio. Thank you so much for your uh, comments. Uh, first of all, how do you both see the relationship with the South, the global South, and the situation since February 2024? Because some, of course, are talking about this sort of new version of the Bandung conference spirit. Uh, secondly, the Gaza-Israel conflict, yeah. which is raging, uh, which both sides have a particular point of view. And third, on the military issue, uh, I think I tend to differ from what I've heard so far here in terms of the relationship of China with the Russian military right now. Uh, they haven't adopted the Lend-Lease program, if you will, uh, in 1941, which we did with the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, heavy truck importation has gone significantly up. And the Russians are now on a 24-hour industrial mobilization. They need trucks to motorize those troops that they're Jim, I'm going to cut you so, off. Yeah, but just I just, just want to yeah. make those points. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, let's turn to the conflict in the Middle East. Has the conflict in the Middle East, the Israel Hamas war, has it complicated or created wedges in the Sino Russian relationship? Or has it added more sort of fuel to sort of being able to accuse the U.S. of hypocrisy, double standards, right? The, the kind of anti-ordering message that they were on. And then maybe also uh, address Jim's comments about the sort of global south, too, in that context. Um, Yun? I can, I can go first on the, on, the, on the Gaza crisis. It's certainly seen as a game changer in terms of the war in Ukraine. I mean, if you look, at, so? the, if you look at the debate in Washington, well, well, who deserves our, our aid more? Are we being stretched on two different fronts in terms of how much assistance we can provide? And what is the sustainability of our current security commitment to both um, 
Ukraine and also to the to the to the main maintenance of stability in the Middle East. I think we're just looking at the United States as stretched very thin between two different fronts. And think about the Russia rapprochement with North Korea and the ever growing rhetoric from uh, from from North Korea about about a potential escalation with South Korea. I think we're just looking at the U.S. strategic resources and attention span being spread across the board. And I think for China, not bad news. Yeah. That a more distracted United States means less attention and less focus on West Pacific, mm -hmm. which which is China's primary theater. And for Russia, I have to imagine, at least from the Chinese perspective, that hey, well, how is Russia going to lose in the war of Ukraine now? <laughs> that if, uh, if 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 the U.S. assistance to to Ukraine is not going to be as sustainable as it used to be, then the choice will be on Europe as for do they want to continue to support uh, support this campaign? I think those are all difficult questions, but I haven't seen any Chinese narrative. Of course, instability in the Middle East is not good news, and especially if it comes to the disruption of oil production and uh, energy supply, energy transportation. But so far, at least in the, in the case of the war in Ukraine, I haven't seen it being portrayed as bad news for, uh, for Russia, at least not in the Chinese narrative. Right. So, so on, on the question of the Middle East, Russia has been deeply opportunistic, and this is not new in Russian foreign policy. They generally try to be opportunistic um, in in uh, exploiting problems for the West in the global South. Of course, Gaza makes it all the easier. Uh, because uh, if we previously had problems winning the global south to our point of view in relation to Ukraine, well, try doing it now. Uh, you know, they'll, they're not stupid, right? They can see what's in front of their eyes. Uh, so, so the Russians, uh, uh, I won't say half a point, but what they are doing is they are uh, exploiting the uh, ground that is already fertile, that's seething with anti-Western resentment in much of the global south there. They are, uh, and this is again a long, part of a long tradition going back to the Cold War. The Soviets used to do that. They claimed that they had no, you know, unlike the Western imperialists, they were this, you know, liberators. They were helping the global south, which was at that time called the Third World. Uh, never mind that, of course, they were themselves an empire. Uh, obviously in Central Asia. They were bringing delegations to Tashkent saying, look, we're doing this wonderful things for these people in Central Asia, learn from us, so to speak. And I think the Russians are still uh, doing this today, opportunistically, cynically, exploiting conflicts in the global south. For them, what's happening in Gaza is a blessing. It's great, mm -hmm. uh, it's fantastic, and it's part of that strategy that we refer to first, going back to Mao Zedong's, uh, you know, everything under heaven is, is great chaos. The more chaos, the better. There's a Russian saying, you can catch fish in muddy waters. Uh, do, do you want me to, to question, uh, address the military issue? Yes, uh, let's do it quickly and then we'll, we'll, we'll go back. For on on Jim's question on the military relationship, I disagree. I disagree with this. And that is, uh, where do I disagree? I, I, you know, the relationship, they have joint exercises in places. They're trying to build trust. They are not anything like NATO in the sense that they don't have joint command. They don't have interoperability uh, in terms of their weapon systems. Uh, and uh, uh, they... Um, uh, they do not have alliance commitments. So, for example, if today Russia invaded Poland, we hope that Article 5, we, I mean we Europeans, never mind you guys, <laughs> we hope America will come protect us, right? We hope. Now, it may well be that this is not going to happen. And, you know, Article 5 will turn out to be just empty phrase. But in Russian Chinese relations, there's no Article 5, right? So it's a very different, militarily, it's a very different story. Yeah. Can I just okay. want, add one thing on the Global South? Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a well-debated issue in China. That, well, China has, for the longest time, portrayed itself as a member of the developing country bloc. But if you think about Global South, it's, it's actually a concept versus Global North, right? And if you think about the Chinese narrative during COVID, the rise of the East and decline of the West, the Chinese has been asserting its, its well, leadership almost among the Global East, which is more of a political um, concept. Compared to Global South, it's more of a socioeconomic concept. Um, so I think for, for, for the Chinese, there's actually plenty of Chinese analysts would agree that well, India is a true leader of Global South, not China. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so now what I'd like to do, because we are running short on time, I would like to take all the questions, so please, 
ask them, and then I will ask our speakers to perhaps pick among the responses. I'll make sure that everyone's questions addressed. Um, and so we'll, we'll close it out that way. So let's start with my colleague, Elise. Hi, Elise Giuliano. Thank you for a really stimulating set of comments today. I'll be brief. Uh, one question uh, for Ms. Um, Soon, you didn't mention China's investments in Ukraine, which are not insignificant uh, as maybe a problem for China. Do you think that figures at all into its um, conception of the war and Russia's <laughs> rationality in starting this war? And uh, a broader question about the Korean Peninsula. Uh, how is maybe China reacting to the changing relationship between Russia and North Korea, or any other comment on the changing relationship between Russia and North Korea and what that might mean for uh, regional security? Thank you. Great. Thanks for those. Peter. Two very short questions. Sergey, I loved your point about a genuinely crazy Patrushev. Do you think Mr. Patrushev actually thinks about China at all, and do you think he's worried? And uh, for you and my question, I've read articles about Chinese scholars who write about the centuries-old treaties in which China ceded a fair amount of territory to Russia, and, and some of them even have maps that show these cities in Chinese with Chinese names. Do you give much credence to that being a potential, a potential problem? Great. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, hi, my name is Bo Yang. I'm a student at the Harriman Institute. Thanks, uh, both of you, for your talk. Um, so since Ms. Sun mentioned the nuanced relationship between China and Russia, and Dr. Rachenko uh, mentioned the relationship between Xi and Putin, I was wondering to what degree does this um, bilateral relationship depends on these two individuals, or um, if there's any changes in leadership, um, what kind of change do we expect? Thank you. Great, thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Zixian, and I'm a PhD student from the History Department here at Columbia. And I have two questions for you guys. The first one would be, how do you perceive the changing relationship between uh, India and China, and also India and Russia, uh, influence the Sino-Russian uh, um, standing in the relationship towards the Ukrainian war? Um, and the second question would be, um, under what circumstances would the Russian publics change their attitudes towards China to realize that, hey, China is the uh, country that we ca can like rely on to, to, for the victory of the war or for changing, for example, like economic situations in Russia. Okay, and last but not least, thank you so much for being patient. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, my question is for Yunsen. Uh, my name is Tendor. I'm uh, a PhD student in the political science department. Um, you mentioned um, that in a way, the fact that Russia is being frozen out of, thrown out of the uh, global banking and financial systems, how that particular thing has been a blessing in disguise of sorts for China, because now that has given the Chinese government the opportunity to kind of experiment with alternative kind of financial or banking systems. Um, and and that, seems, that seems to mean that, you know, the Chinese government thinks that there is a realistic chance of similar sanctions being levied against China. And it's really hard to imagine this kind of global sanctions on China in the absence of a invasion of Taiwan. So to what extent can we read this as a sign that the Chinese government may be in, uh, planning on invading Taiwan? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, really quick, we're gonna we're gonna have to call it one question. Yeah. Okay. Today I read the news that says there's a two uh, twenty billion like U.S. dollars through the coins uh, method to Russia. Is this news? Do you think this news is true? If it's true, do you think which country sent it to Russia? Okay. All right. So I, we got to call it. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're gonna go uh, three minutes each speaker. We're gonna start with Sergey, and then we'll end with uh, <laughs> Jensen. So, uh, very, very good questions, Patrushev, Peter's question, Patrushev and, um, and, and, and China, what, you know, does he even talk about China? He never, he likes to talk about how the, you know, America will come to meet its end uh, because of there's a super volcano under the United States that's just waiting to explode. <laughs> Right, I, I kid yeah. you not. There was an interview like that. Remember that one? You know, and that's what that actually is. Kind of makes you wonder whether this guy is 
crazy or not, which I think he, I think he is. My general sense is that in the Russian security community, i.e. the intelligence uh, services, etc., China is seen, uh, they, they, they approach China with suspicion. Um, they're worried about Chinese espionage, for example. There have been cases of uh, Russian scientists being kind of uh, 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 tried and put in prison for espionage, uh, for, for selling secrets to China. And this has not changed. So I think there's a fundamental kind of distrust there at the level of the uh, kind of intelligence community, so to speak. Uh, and on the question, and on the second question about uh, the, the board, that actually fascinates me as well. But we have to be uh, very careful because Chinese maps, and you would know better than me, but going back years, actually, they always have in parentheses all the places in the Russian Far East, they all, always have Chinese names in parentheses. It's not a new thing, it's always been there. So, Haishin uh, Wai, you know, Boli for Khabarovsk, all of those places have Chinese. Uh, the one question that puzzles me, I don't understand it at all, is that the Russians and the Chinese, they've signed a treaty to uh, figure out who, who the island, uh, the island next to Khabaras belongs to. They agreed to divide the island. Um, in, it's, a, it's an actual not, a, it's a small island, right? They agreed to divide it, and yet on Chinese maps now, they show the island as Chinese. And this is, and I, I, I looked at it myself, I actually went to Heilongjiang, a, a f provincial government, I downloaded their official maps, it's right there. Mm. It, it's interesting the Russians are not making a fuss about this. You know why? Remember how I said that they're really careful not to upset the Chinese and not to derail this relationship? It's sort of they're, they're letting the sleeping dogs lie. They're, they don't want to raise it, because for now at least the Chinese are not claiming Siberia or like Mao Zedong saying, Kamchatka, yo, this is China. <laughs> China is not doing that. So some island, who cares, right? So they, they have it on their maps, so, so who cares? So that's my understanding of Russia's position, but I would, I would love to, he to hear why the Chinese are doing this. I, I don't understand this. Um, with Boyan's question, uh, uh, two individuals, uh, uh, Putin and Xi Jinping, if one of them is run over by, the bu by a bus or something, you know, what happens to the relationship? As I mentioned in my talks, I think this, re uh, this relationship, uh, while shaped in some ways by personalities of these individuals, is deeper than the two individuals. And I would say I'm actually, you know, I'm quite well known as a, as a Putin basher, right? I'm a Putin basher to such an extent that I cannot even go back to Russia now because I'm afraid that I'll be arrested there. Um, but if I would say, you know, Putin was run over by a bus and I went to Russia and I said, oh, okay, somebody let me run the foreign ministry and as a very pro-Western person. You know, I would say, the first thing I would say, I would say we need to preserve a good relationship with China because it's, it's strategically important for Russia from the standpoint of Russia's national interest, objectively defined. So I think that even if Putin is out of the picture and somebody more liberal, which is not in the cart, comes to power or whatever, you know, or Patrushev comes to power, I think the general strategic direc direction will be continued. And finally, uh, when will uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian public change their views of China? Uh, it, what's interesting about this relationship, and that's again something I tried to emphasize in my, in my conversation uh, earlier, is how it's, it's a, it, so, it's a socially shallow relationship. So the public, or the Russian public, largely reacts to government narratives, uh, as as you know, they go with whatever the government tells them. So in the 1950s, they embrace China. This are our our little brothers. We're so happy with them. You know, 10 years later, oh, these are our worst enemies. You know, now we love them again. We love them again. But really, fundamentally, if tomorrow somebody says, no, no, sorry, you know, China are actually, they're bad guys, immediately you'll have the same problems that will reemerge. You know, racism towards China, cultural distance, et cetera, all of that will reemerge. Right. Yeah. Um, great. Well, Chinese investment in Ukraine, if you look at the bilateral relationship, China actually imported uh, more wheat and agricultural products from Ukraine compared to, to Russia. But if you also look at how China reacted to the Russia annex of, uh, of, of Crimea back in 2014, um, and how China basically maintained the same ambiguity and the same tacit, well, tacit ambivalence on this issue, it has not really had a significant impact over China-Ukraine relations. And even today, if you look at uh, Kiev's position towards China, it's still very much that we want China to support. Right, so you have to you have to think about the, the cost benefit analysis. What is the cost uh, of China's current policy in the Ukraine war uh, on the on the Ukraine front? And 
I think people would say not much. So um, from a, again, um, the strategic importance of Russia and Ukraine are completely different for China, not, not even on the, on the same level. So I think the Chinese uh, coming back to the pragmatism, there's no, uh, not a lot of questions asked about this, uh, about this choice. Korean Peninsula, yes, Russia, DPRK, rapprochement, um, my characterization of China's position is that China is annoyed because nobody wants these two countries to get more leverage and less dependence on China. But it is not yet concerned because one, China's national interest has not come under real threat. And two, China's role in both economies are irreplaceable by anybody. Uh, so it holds critical leverage. On the issue of the map, um, well, I, I, I think you can always play with the map and how, uh, how the Chinese terms, how the Chinese names are shown on the map. But on the official level, these, um, these territories are uh, adjudicated. They are demarcated. There's no, there's no going back. That the treaties have already been signed. Once in a while, you hear some social outcry that we should, Chinese should get those territories back. Not going to happen. Um, in terms of the bilateral relationship, how much it depends on the individual, at least from the Chinese perspective, um, I would, I would have a different characterization from what Sergey just said. This relationship is, or well, this personal relationship is not mutual. I think in many ways it's more Xi Jinping's unilateral affinity towards Russian culture, towards the admiration for Putin's strongman style, and the, the pursuit of a Putin style strategic maneuver in the international relations that's driving the Chinese leader's assessment and in the pro-Russia direction. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, well, you might remember a few, uh, Wall Street Journal had this article describing that how she, uh, a few years ago, received a report of, written by the Chinese government analyst, basically describing Russian economy as having no future. And according to Wall Street Journal, the response from Xi written on that report is this is completely bullshit. Mm -hmm. So I think that decision or that affinity or that almost favorable perception of Russia and the Russian, Russian national strength, uh, comprehensive national power, strongly co colors Chinese leaders' assessment about the Russian behavior and the consequences of that behavior. It may not be a mutual relationship that Xi Jinping and Putin hang out all the time, but it's more of the Chinese bias when they look at Russia and, and, and Russian behavior. Um, in terms of India, I, I, I'm not worried about the conflict between China and India because China is having a major reassessment of India and India's future and also India's rise as and the Chinese term is India actually might make it. What is it? The great power status because of the, well, on one hand, they see that Modi has been so effective domestically, right? This is something that the Chinese had always in the past laughed about India, that democracy is messy, unable to be effective or efficient, but now Modi is actually pretty effective despite all the criticisms. And internationally, India is receiving all this international support for India to grow into a, a bigger, uh, stronger power. So I'm not worried about China, India broke about having a war because that's, that's not Beijing's inclination. Um, in terms of the financial system, well, I think what the Chinese have learned in the many years after Tiananmen or even during the Cold War is China's vulnerability in the international financial system, right? It's a dollar-dominated system. Uh, when China, well, when in globalization, China was, ex uh, was accepted into WTO and immersed itself in that system, it also opens, up, opens itself to a lot of vulnerability. Um, I'll give you a most simple example. Uh, if US decides that uh, Chinese banks dealing with Iran cannot use dollars for their transaction or any banks that use these dollars cannot have transaction with that particular bank. It means significant pressure or vulnerability on China's part. So I think the Chinese have always had this desire to, de to develop something in parallel. That something that will not be displacement or replacement of the US dollar dominant system, but at least something in parallel that could run in the event that China faces the same level or even more severe international financial sanctions like the, the ones that Russia are currently under. So it's testing this alternative system uh, with the understanding that it's not going to replace what China currently has with the rest of the world, but to have this alternative system in parallel is in no way being seen as against China's national interest. I don't think it's necessarily uh, tied to China's desire to, uh, to invade Taiwan, 
But when we talk about the polarization or the decoupling of the two economy, inevitably we're going to see the creation of two parallel universes, and this is only one example. Thank Great, you. thank you. So, Andy, do you have any last thoughts or comments? Or? <laughs> uh, no. Okay, so the first time. job of the moderator is to keep the time. I failed, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm really not sorry because the, the opportunities for interaction between our community